My philosophy on rankings is all rankings are bogus. We just advertise the ones that show us better. That's it. Uh, but all, all rankings are bogus. Especially the US News and World Report rankings are just as carefully done as the people's sexiest man or woman in life. Very true. Yeah. 
I don't know how you measure it. Is this the number of numbers? It's like the number of numbers. Okay, there's more than one. Oh, that's true. I can't see the number. It's faster. Okay. So, what's the deal about the first two or false? And an MDP agent enters a state S, which is guaranteed to get both the state's reward and the state's value. You talked about reward and value, right? Um, yeah. Who has an answer? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's guaranteed to get the state's reward. Uh -huh. um, I'm still not sure about whether it gets the state's value. Uh huh. What do other anybody else say? Anything? Why might not the agent get the state's value? Because its value is what it gets from its previous states as well. What? Uh, because it gets a part of its value from the previous state. No, not at all. It's completely wrong. Change the mind, you know. Actually change your mind. Value is cost to go or reward to go. There is no previous state. It's extremely important to remember that. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Past is past. Okay. Um, so there is no G. You don't actually need G to talk about policies. Okay. So it's a very important thing. Again, as I said, there are like a million ways of misunderstanding anything. And so I try some of the ones that people normally fall for and then you know look for it. But certainly it has nothing to do with the value from the previous states. Value is about accumulate the reward you might get from here on. Rj cost to go is the cumulative cost you are likely to incur from here on. Yes. So that would be fair to say that they're guaranteed cold because the reward is what they get when they get to the state. Mm -hmm. But then the value is, is what's incurred from here on. Yeah, but the... <laughs> yes, but... So, uh, wait. so let's actually, okay, let's put it this way. Uh, maybe uh, get the state's reward and the state's, let's say, I'll see if I say optimal value. In general, oh. when people say, think of value, they tend to think of optimal value. Okay. okay. So, and I don't think they would be guaranteed because they get something could happen here, here, and then they need to introduce anything that really happen along the way that would cause them to change their path. What do you mean something can happen? Like no, somebody else. Here. Somebody else here has this. This is their hand. Yes. Actions are stochastic, so you're not necessarily going to go where you're going. That's not the reason. Again, these are all good things because that tells me that there's still some knobs to be adjusted in your brain's understanding of this stuff. Okay. The stochasticity is taken into account in computing the value because it's called the expected cumulative reward. 
expected, not guaranteed. Yes, you can get a lot of Yeah, but I mean, okay, then it's a very interesting question. So then it's, it's guaranteed to get both the state's reward and maybe then say is expected to get the state's optimal value. Is expected to get the state's optimal value. Do you at least expect it in, you know, do you? Okay. Why did people get into college? Why, why take, why enroll in, why get to college? Yes. It's more like the ability to take a, job, a better job in the future. You'll get a better job. So when you come into the college, there is a reward for being in the college such as the Saturday, Friday night, the well race. And then the expected value, the, the, the optimal value is maybe whatever your favorite job is, your Google job or your grad school or whatever. Is it possible for people who join the college not to get, even in expectation, the optimal value? Yeah, if they just sit and not show up for classes and go to every possible Friday night party, <laughs> right? Do you guys understand that? It's extremely important to understand this. The value is a promise and is predicated on your freedom to act and that you are using the freedom to act in the right way. So an optimal policy would have been computed. And if you actually do follow the optimal policy, starting from this state, then you are guaranteed to get in expectation the optimal value. If on the other hand, if on the other hand, you do not, you follow a completely different policy, not the optimal policy, and you're not guaranteed to get the optimal value. Optimal value is a possibility. As they say, they opened the door for you. Okay, being in college opens the door to get a high paying job. After that, we just sit at the door. Nothing. Don't complain to me saying oh, people said if I go to college, I'll get a good job. No, there is the people who didn't even get into the college, they don't have the policy, you know, the, the ability to do the actions that you guys get to do, but choose not to do because you are having too many fun bodies. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a very, very, very important distinction. Value is a promise about how much you can get if you do the right actions. And so, in fact, to make things this, by the way, some of the issues like, well, even if the optimal value in expectation is 100, maybe you may not get it. You, a single student, may not get it. That's very reasonable, right? Because real world is realistic actions. So you wake up, you come to the class, you get run over by the bus. I'm not saying it'll happen to you, but it could. There was one poor student who got run over by the bus about seven years back in front of the student books, in, in, the, in front of the bookstore. Those were the days the ASU uh, buses will make a turn right at the ASU bookstore. You guys remember the bookstore there is a thing? They were doing it fine. And one day, one student was going and the bicycle fell in front of the bus. The bus could stop. It's not that they were going very fast or anything. There is uncertainty in the world. That guy was actually probably going to the class. He was trying to follow his optimal policy. But he certainly did not get the optimal value in that case. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in fact, to distinguish between the stochasticity effects and the asymptotic effects, think in terms of deterministic MDPs. If it's a deterministic MDP, I can still ask this question. 
In that case, your problem won't exist. <coughs> Deterministic MPP is A star, essentially. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So what basically what happens then is in the case of deterministic, it clears out the stochastic aspect of it. The funny thing is the stochasticity will make people, lull people into thinking, oh, maybe the reason I didn't get a good job after getting into the college is because some people get it, some people don't get it. Ignoring the fact that you never went to the class. You were never going to get a job. You understand what I'm saying? You just lulled yourself into thinking, since there is a possibility that people can also not get a job because maybe this poor guy got run over. Maybe that happened to me. No, that didn't happen to you. Your freedom of choice, you abused. So there's a very important difference between value and reward. Value. You will get optimal value only if you were to do optimal policy. And even then, in expectation. It's a very you know, deep point, and it's not obvious to people. And it's, that's why I want to bring it up. Any questions on this? OK. True or false, the smaller the agent's discount factor, the longer it will need to think about its future. In sort of future, basically means computing the optimal policy. Remember the point about discount factor? Discount factor is essentially this idea that if you are here in this time step one, step two, you get R1 reward. Step three, you get R2 reward. Step four, you get R4, R3 reward, or so on. Uh, actually, let me just make it this way. Zero, one, two, three, okay? Three, zero, one, two, three are the states. R1, R2, R3 are the rewards. Rather than adding them up, which is a reasonable thing to do, except it won't work if you have infinitely long trajectories, you would wind up doing sigma gamma power i r power i. Gamma over I, R I. Where gamma is zero, less than or equal to gamma, strictly less than or equal to one. That's the discount factor. Because if it's equal to one, then basically you're not discounting it. So I'm talking about an agent which might have a smaller the agent's discount factor, the longer it will be to think about its future. So since gamma is only between zero and one, the smaller means it's closer to zero. Largest gamma can ever be is close to one. So every damn thing that we're talking about in MDP, they're like billions of real life connections. In addition to understanding the formalism. So, what do you think is the, is this true or false? Yes, go ahead. No, discount factor of one basically makes things degenerate. Yeah. I mean, that's a reasonable way of thinking about it. So, so then what is your answer? Um, just extrapolating just that I would assume false, right? Yeah. By the way, that's a reasonable way of figuring out these kinds of things. Look at the corner cases, the end cases, extreme cases. But then since actually one is not really hand allowed for us, but so close to one is allowed, so it's limiting is fine. Somebody else think about the zero case, gamma equal to zero. Yeah? Then we can't really go back. It's like, if we're going, if it's this count means that we can go, uh, it's like it's red cycles, right? No, so basically what really is happening is you should actually say you are in state zero, you already got the reward of that state R0. Mm -hmm. So then you are essentially doing gamma power i r i. So that means gamma power zero, r zero plus gamma power one, r one plus gamma power two, r two plus gamma power three, r three, etc. 
Oh, so right? Okay. So if gamma is zero, what happens? Zero is constant. No. Yeah. You guys have to remember the math. Gamma is zero, all these guys become zero. Zero for zero is what? One. How to use the math? Right. So when gamma equal to zero, then if I tell you, here is all the here's a large trajectory that you are going to go through. He says, screw the rest of the trajectory. I'm going to die in essence. Basically, gamma power zero basically means nothing other than present matters. So the immediate reward is the only thing I'm ever going to experience. Do you guys get that? Immediate reward is the only thing that I'm ever going to experience. So in fact, you will see this in a minute in doing the finite value, finite horizon MDPs. There is a connection between discount factor and the horizon. Remember those of you who have seen the, the, the example of doing finite horizon marcodation process, you saw if you are at zero steps to go, that means you have no more steps to live, then your value is your reward. That's like a very important point. That's basically like saying my discount factor is zero. So in fact, the discount factor has it, you know, can be interpreted as the probability that your life will end. Do you see what I'm saying? It's actually one minus discount factor is proportional to the probability that your life will end. Which basically means when gamma equal to zero, probability that your life will end one. So in this state, you are next state, you're dead. Okay. So it's a very interesting point that gamma is proportional to one minus gamma is probability is proportional to the probability that MDP ends. That means your, your horizon ends. Yes. There be multiple discount factors. Normally the models, it's a, it's a very good point, but mostly people use the model where they just assume. In the beginning, they assume single discount factor. But you can obviously start with high discount factors and reduce the discount factor later on, or you can have a schedule of using discount factors. Those are all possible. But most of the analysis is typically done assuming and most of the elementary analysis of MDPs is typically done, assuming that there is a single discount factor for it, which is a reasonable assumption. So here's another interesting thing. Is there a connection between gamma and optimism versus pessimism of the agent? Somebody from this other part of the room which they, I'm really hope, I think they're hoping that I don't see them, which I cannot because it's so far away. But once in a while, you should speak up if you're wasting time showing up for the classes. Is there a connection between gamma and optimism and pessimism? Again, there is a self-sorting in classes. People who don't know and don't care tend to go farther and farther away. And so I would actually suggest that people who are sitting by habit, as far away from this place as possible, consider changing that policy. Yes, go ahead. I guess. I mean, if one minus gamma is related to uh, the uh, probability that MDP ends, then wouldn't larger gammas be more pessimism? Or is that backwards? No. Um, the smaller gammas means more pessimism, larger gammas means more optimism. And the real reason when gamma is closer to one, the reason policy becomes hard is here is a very interesting thing. Your optimal policy becomes hard when you think the world will be around for quite a long time. 
what I'm saying. If I were to tell you this evening, the end of the world is occurring. All of a sudden, there is no project deadline. You don't need to worry about projects. You don't need to worry about grades. Everybody's gone. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? What is the optimal policy? Leave the class, have fun until the end of the day. Very easy to compute. Your life is actually hard because you live longer. Strange as it might seem. You see what I'm saying? Again, it's only hard because you're trying to do the optimal thing in your life. To the extent you're trying to do the optimal thing in the life, if you think you will live long and the place around you is not going to get bombed out of smithereens, then you need to basically, it's all in your hands about doing the right things. Whereas if there's going to be a bombing of MP and by the end of the day that MP will be gone, hey, fun star. I know I can't do anything about it, but at least my God, my brain won't be heated up trying to compute the optimal policy. Because everybody's optimal policy is just enjoy the current state. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go further. Um, yeah. So this one actually, yeah. So I spent time also teaching people outside of ASU, I guess, in essence, because anyway, I'm teaching you. So this is the thing that I was telling you last time. There is an obvious connections between A star and MDP. It's not typically acknowledged. So if you notice in the textbook, MDP is 17th chapter. A star is like third chapter. They don't talk about A star by the time of MDP. It's like different words. But the reality is your intuitions can come from simpler cases. And if you don't have intuitions, you know, the many mistakes that you make, the mysteries of MDPs melt away if you understand the connections between what part of MDP corresponds to what part of ASTAR. And I mentioned that last time, and I'm going to repeat some of those. The reward R, are equivalently the immediate cost C, is basically the edge cost in ASTAR search. Similarly, the value V, are the cost to go estimate J is the normal heuristic because H of any SR search is cost to go. The value V star, which is the optimal cost to go, and it's optimal value, optimal reward, stimulated reward you can get, and J star, which is optimal cost to go, is connected to H star. As I said, the entire A star is more connected to the cost-oriented interpretation of MP rather than the reward-oriented interpretation of MP. They're just duals, right? Negative of cost is reward, negative of reward is cost. Okay. And then when you're talking about a policy in MDP, you're talking about a path in Asia. You're talking about an optimal policy in MDP, you're talking about an optimal path in Asia. Okay. Yeah. Similarly, if I give you a policy, one of the big things that people get confused when they start looking at in, in, in MDP is I will give you the policy and I ask you to compute the value corresponding to that. That means if the agent specifically follows a particular policy, that means when I'm in state S1, I'll do action A1. State S2, I'll do action A2. Station A3, I'll do action A3. That's it. On that say there are only three states. Okay, if I'm following this policy, then what is the expected value of S1, S2, S3 with respect to this policy? We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, but really that's connected to, I'm sorry, that, that's connected to the cost to go of a path. Suppose in A star search, here is S, A, B, C, G. Okay. Suppose I tell you this is the path I'm using. Then I can compute how much would be the distance here, how much would be the distance from here to here, how much is the distance from here to here, how much is the distance from here to here. Just add up the edge class. So you convert it. 
policy into value. Policy being path into value being cost to go. Equivalently, if I were to give you a cost to go for each of the nodes, then you can convert it into your policy. So in A star, imagine in A star search, there's a tree, and for every node, I have given you like an H value for those nodes. Right? If I give you H value and you assume the H value is as good as it gets, that means I don't have any better estimate. Then at every node, I can do greedy policy. Basically, from every node, I consider the nodes that I can reach. And for to each of them, I know the G plus H value. You see what I'm saying? And I figure out whichever is the smallest. And that's how the path starts. So you can convert H into a path. In fact, you convert H star into a path in H star all the time. Okay. And then similarly, so the value of policy is the cost to go of a path and optimal policy can be taken, you know, can be connected to optimal, optimal value. value. This is like a big thing we make a huge deal about in MDG. Optimal value and policy are duals of each other. It's not dual system. I mean, given the optimal value, you can compute the optimal policy. Given the optimal policy, you can compute the optimal value. Which is why even though what you really want to compute in MDP is the policy. That is what should the agent do, right? But we compute value instead. Most of the time you talk about value iteration because if you get the value, you can convert it into policy. The same thing you did in A star, what you really wanted was the path. But in a weird way, if you were to compute the H star value for all the nodes, then the path will just come out free. And again, remember, for A star, computing H star is an overkill because of determinism. In fact, if you do H star, then essentially A star will be able to solve the problem in such a way that if you find yourself in any node, you know the optimal path. And in fact, if you have this pesky kid who after you get to a node, they can just transpose you to a different node. You still know what's the optimal path from there because you're computed optimal path from everywhere, which is what MDP does. Okay. So those connections are very helpful and it's useful to know that it's all basically the deterministic cases are nothing to sneeze at because those we understand. Again, for example, people delude themselves that when they don't get the optimal expected value, they might think well, it's statistically maybe I didn't get it. The tricky thing is Statistically, you're doing the right thing and you're not getting the optimal value statistically. Versus you're doing the wrong thing and you are never going to get the optimal value anyway. You can't tell so just from one experience. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so you can delude yourself. Think, oh, I did everything. You know, I mean, looks like it's supposed not to happen. It's a stochastic world. <laughs> Just because it's stochastic doesn't mean that you can remove your brain and put it on the table. It's supposed to be harder, not easier to deal with stochastic words. But many people use the stochasticity as an excuse. Nobody is expected to do well in the college. So what is the point in doing well in the college? I mean, some possibility exists that you don't, well in the, don't do well in the college. But comparing yourself to people who actually go to the classes, and saying they didn't do well too in the end, and I also didn't do well in the end, so it's all the same. It's strange. And you can formally state why it is wrong in, you know, in viewing this in terms of the MDP values. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, so this one, I just want to make sure that we are all on the same page. Um, so suppose I'm here, this is one three, one three, okay? And I'm doing a trajectory is basically a state action sequence. 
S0, A0, S1, A1, S2, A2, S3, A3, etc. That's a sequence. That's what we mean by a trajectory. It's also what is meant by a behavior. So if you're looking at the agent from outside, it's in one state, it did an action, it went to the next state, it did another action, it went to the next state. So you're seeing the agent's trajectory, its behavior. And sometimes the behavior is irrational, like last time somebody was asking, why the heck are you, you know, going away from the goal? Where, and then I tried to point out to you that the reason is because of the way the probabilities are, your, your probability of falling into minus one state and dying are minimized if you go away from the minus one state rather than just go perpendicular to it. It's all numbers, it makes sense. And in real life, you do this too. At least I do it when I'm walking on the Grand Canyon trails. Right? Okay. So anyway, so just make sure that we are here, right? So tell me, what is the cumulative reward here? We kept talking about this all the time, right? So you should be able to find out what the cumulative reward here is. For this problem, which you have seen multiple times. So basically, because you are in one three, you already get a minus 0.4, minus 0.04. What? The other starting point, right? Now, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm looking at this is, you know, yeah, this no. is one and this is three. This is what I'm thinking of, I didn't Yeah, that, that three, four would be off. off so, anyway, let's forget about it. So, let's just, these are the states I want. Okay. That's the states. Okay. Um, yeah, you're right. One, three, and yeah, no, this is two, three. This is three, three. This is, oh, this is three, three, and this is four, three, is what you're saying. That's, okay, so coordinate system. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm basically thinking in terms of X and Y coordinates. You're thinking in terms of row column, either which is fine, okay? Because I'm looking at it as a grid, I'm thinking in terms of X, Y coordinates. So X coordinate is four, Y coordinate is three for that. Okay. So anyway, so this is minus 0.04. This is another minus 0.04. This is another minus 0.04. And this is a plus one. So you go to your calculators, add them up. That's the cumulative reward. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, if you go to the negative one state, would that mean a zero reward at that state? Oh no, it's plus minus one. Over one is plus one and one is minus one. Yes. Okay. You got that? I mean, this is, you're supposed to have gotten this. I'm just doing some sanity checks. Um, no. um, so here's the other interesting thing. Why do I have to give action as well as the state? Why do I have to say state, action, state? If you're doing it, if this was A star search, that means if it was a deterministic MDP, you realize that you don't need to give the state. After the action, the state is guaranteed to be the state that the action takes you to. The reason you have to give in general, both action and the state, the next state is because actions might take you to multiple states. This particular time, it took you to that state. Here is an interesting other question. So is this even a is that even a trajectory that this MDP agent will ever be able to execute? That's not what I'm saying. Why? Because there is no way in given the actions you have been given, there's no way an agent here could find itself here. You understand that? So again, even though there is stochasticity, 
there are things which are lots infeasible there are things which are extremely unlikely and all that Shaka says it doesn't mean that anything is possible. See what I'm saying? Okay. Now, the other thing that I want to say is the only difference in this, so this is the cumulative reward. If you were to do discounted cumulative reward, if you were to do discounted cumulative reward with, let's say, gamma equal to 0.3, for the same, for this same. Sequence, the numbers would be 0.3 power 0 times minus 0 0.04 plus 0 0.3 power 1 times minus 0 0.04 plus 0 0.3 power 2 times minus 0 0.04 plus 0 0.3 power 3 times 1. This is what I mean. I will only be doing gamma power. I mean, basically, I will be doing this, right? Gamma power i, r i. I'll use this, but that's what I meant in terms of numbers. And if you saw the finite horizon MDP value iteration with numbers, today I'm doing the abstract version as to why that actually makes sense. I think if you actually watched it, you already know why it works, because I also. I didn't just do it, I kind of explained why it was working. So here we'll do it without numbers. Okay. Any questions? So there could be behaviors given a, an action model. An action model basically means, you know, if you do this action in this state, what states can it reach? Given an action model, then in essence, there are certain states that certain sequences that are more versus less likely, the behavior sequences. You see what I'm saying? So just because it's, you know, basically, so most of the time when, when we are walking normally, we don't fall. But there is a very small probability that when we are walking, we'll put one leg, you know, behind or in front of the other leg and then fall down. Right? It's like Marx Brothers comedy or something. But that doesn't happen often, which is why it's funny, I guess. If you're falling every time, you'll get bored to then we'll look for somebody else who is actually walking. It's, wow, this guy is walking. Let's fall, laugh at them. Right? Okay, so the idea is that a behavior trace has different probabilities depending on the action model. Which also tells you something jumping ahead. In this part of the lecture, we're assuming action models are given and the reward models are given. That means for every action, you essentially have, for every action A, you in essence, imagine there are states S1, et cetera, Sn, S1, et cetera, Sn, the n states. An action is specified in a sense, in the most primitive sense, by putting probabilities in each of these, in this matrix, n by n matrix. You see what I'm saying? So if I, for example, put 0.3 here, and this is like S15, I put 0.6 here, and this uh, 0.1 here. That means if I were to do action A in state S1, I will go into, I will remain in S1 with 0.3 probability, go to S15 with 0.6 probability, go to whatever, N state with 0.1 probability. So each action is specified, Actions are n by n probability matrices. Actually, they're called stochastic matrices. In the sense that they should all be positive numbers and every row must sum to one. Right? Because the actions should basically, all the possibilities should sum, all the probabilities should sum to one. Okay, here's the other question. So for yes, S-term search, does this representation still work?
That means if the action is deterministic, does this representation still make sense? Exactly, it will still make sense. It's just that every row will be all zeros except one one. That means each row exactly has one one. There's all this abstract stuff about deterministic, stochastic, but that's basically what it is in terms of. These are what is called the transition matrices. Transition matrix. So when I told you that I gave you the model, transition model, what I mean is I gave you all these numbers. Right? If on the other hand, if I didn't give you these numbers, and you get to see the agent perform, so you know that the agent is in S1 and it did action A1. And it stayed in S1. And you do it again, the same thing. Stay, stay, you know, put the agent back into state S1 again, make it do action A1 again, see where it goes. Keep making it do multiple times. The action A in state S1. Then you get counts. It went into after 100 times, I did this action. Of the 100 times I did this action, 10 times it went into S1, and maybe 70 times it went into S9, and then two, you know, 20 times it went into S50. Then I can convert into probabilities. 10 by 100, 70 by 100, 20 by 100. You did this, what did you do? You learned the action model. So you can tap yourself in the back and say, I'm doing learning. Action models. And in fact, this is what model-based RL does. Reinforcement and it does. <laughs> 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 okay, now, but what else will you do if you didn't have people telling you how the world works? You will try various things and see which are looking feeling good, which are not feeling good. And so that way, so by the way, so the other thing that in, in the saying which are looking good, which are not looking good, I also mentioned that. Remember, the reward metric wasn't given before either. So basically, if you, know, if you don't have action model, this is what you'll do to compute the action probabilities. If you don't know the reward model, what do you do? Well, when you get into that state, you'll feel the reward. Reward is one of these things that just washes over. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's immediate reward. You just, it washes over you. So this is how kids figure out. Right, oh, this looks good, this looks bad. So kids will try any random thing unless you put them in cages. They will go put their hand in the hot stove. It's nice and red. Hey, I want to put everything in my mouth. This red thing I'll try to put in my mouth, put them on the thing. Then their pain sensors will send a nice signal to the brain. They say, oh, are you stupid? Don't do this again. Many kids will stop doing it. Some kids don't stop doing it. They either may not exist or become massacres as they grow old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is reward discovery. You go to the state and feel the reward. So if you discovered the reward and you computed the action probabilities, you're doing reinforcement learning. I'll come back to it next week saying we are doing reinforcement learning, but this is what reinforcement learning really is in the bottom of it all. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so the way so when we did Monte Carlo search, mm. uh, we found probabilities of certain things happening. But in this case, when you're finding a probability for an action in a state, is it's also possible that some other state exists which may be better? So do you have to compensate the same way that we did in Monte Carlo? That's okay. So that basically is what is really called the exploration exploitation trade-off in reinforcement learning, and we'll talk about it. 
In general, if you're just seen, let's say some number of traces of, you know, basically you hung around the world. The normal way of thinking about reinforcement learning is the agent just goes around doing things in the world and tries to learn about the world. If we were supposed to do everything like that, we'll all be dead long back. In fact, you'll be dead in like the first year. Your parents made sure that the things that you would do are not going to end your life if they're good parents. The bad parents, they leave like uncut guns and you know open flames, etc., and say, if they're smart kid, they will survive. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So in general, so reinforcement learning is basically, in fact, just learning from your experience. You can also actually, one of the beautiful things about human life is we can learn from other people's experience. Even kids have mental models. If they see another kid putting a hand on the stove and start crying, some of the smarter kids figure out, maybe I don't want to do that. In fact, most of human civilization is learning from other people's deaths. You see what I'm saying? So you don't learn, start from scratch, but the pure reinforcement learning is learning from experience, your experience. Now the question that brings up is, maybe your experience up until now is not full. Maybe you should do some more random exploration to get a better sense, both of rewards, that means what states are out there that might be giving even better kick for me. And also what sort of true probabilities are there for when you do this action. Maybe the action that I did hundred times, it turns out that if you do it a million times, you know, every three times in a million, this action will take you to action, I mean, to, to state S9000. Turns out S9000 is like this magical state. You go there, reward just washes over you. It's like a lottery state. You never saw that because, in, because probabilistically, it's very unlikely to happen. And so you never saw that. So you essentially decided this is my model and you did an optimal policy with respect to that model. One of the mind bending things about life is an optimal policy with incomplete knowledge can be arbitrarily off. Arbitrarily off from even a bad policy with the complete model. That brings up the question of when do you start saying I've learned enough, I'll start acting now. That's the same thing that Monte Carlo's research were also doing, and this is called the exploration exploitation trade-off. One of the fundamental trade-offs in any life for the intelligent agent artificial are you guys. When do you stop studying? Like bozos like me, never stop. I never got out of school. I'm still in school. Right? Some of your smart friends said elementary school is enough, exploration part is over, now exploitation. And they're making tons of money in flipping burgers or making crypto coins, either one of which. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. So it's a very hard question, how much exploration to do and then start doing exploitation. There are some computational things that we'll talk about just like in that Monte Carlo research. But in general, there is nothing much other than saying the obvious things. That is, you know, Rao, when you're 95, don't still say, I have a few more years of school, and then I'll start taking up a job. If you do that, if Rao's parents are still alive, they'll say, what the heck is going on with this kid? When is this guy ever going to get out of the basement? Right? Still exploring the world. But on the other hand, exploring, exploiting the world after the first year of your elementary school or before, seems kind of unnecessarily harsh. That's why it's a trade-off. It's, a, it's a, a great trade-off that we all deal with. Again, we'll get to it and we'll say it, but much of what is happening here is nonlinear progression over ideas. And then sometimes that actually helps because these are not disconnected ideas. It's not like one DMDP is over and then RL starts. It's all connected. Okay. Yeah. So we talked about this last time, the one way of doing, which is the online policy for MDPs. Right? So then what I want to walk you through, oh, one thing I should probably mention is that 
you know, in fact, RTDP is, you can also see, uh, think of RTDP as game against nature. But if you have games where there is dice involved before you make moves, so you and your opponent make moves based on the dice, you know, what the dice says. Right? Then there is probability of action, stochastic outcomes of the action, as well as your opponent trying to do the maximum damage. So from min max, we went to expect max. That means do expectation maximization, expectation maximization. But you can have games which have two players, two rational players, but they're, they don't get to do their action unless the dice outcome allows them to do that action. Right? Have any of you played snakes and ladders? Have you ever considered playing snakes and ladders without dice? It's like, it's a dumb enough game, but without dice, it's like dumber than dumb. You see what I'm saying? So that's the, Basically, the dice is telling you what things you get to do. So it's constraining your action choice, statistically, probabilistically. You see what I'm saying? So this kind of, there are many games where there is like, you know, a dice throw between the moves. And those will start wind up doing expect T minimax. And I won't go into it, but you know, essentially you can handle it using expectation, minimization, maximization. Okay. So, so the policy to compute the optimal policy as a basically the basic idea is that if you're in some state and you're trying to figure out what is the value of that state, you essentially, you can think of doing probes, starting from the state, wander around for a week. See what action states, do action states, action states. Okay. And then see what cumulative reward you get. And if it's like the total on the average, the cumulative reward that you're getting is high, then it's a good state. So this thing can be separated into two parts. One where you know the policy. That means you decided that my policy is in state S1, I'll do action A1, state S2, action A2, state S3, action A3. So then what I'll do, start from S1, I'll do action A1, see which state happens, then do the action that I'm supposed to do in that state, then see which state happens, then do the action that I'm supposed to do in that state. So now I have a project. I can compute the cumulative reward. Do this a gazillion times. Take the cumulative reward every time divided by the gazillion. I mean, some of the cumulative rewards divided by the gazillion, that will give you the average or expected cumulative reward you will get from the state. That is the value of this state with respect to this policy. Do people get this? Okay. So the first idea we'll try to do is just compute, given a policy. So we're trying to compute optimal policy. First idea to try to do is, you know, if I given a policy, I can try to compute its value. And then basically maybe I'll guess more policies and then compute, compare their values and pick the one which has the best expected value, best expected cumulative value. So, so that's basically what we, would, we could do. And so to be able to do that, you need to talk about the value of a policy. Value of a policy is like path to go of a path. If I tell you the path in the A star search, then you can compute what for each of the nodes in that path, starting from the back bottom where the goal is, what is the cost to go to the node goal in that path? Well, I already gave you the path. You don't have to do it a zillion times because it's a deterministic case. Because MDPs can have stochastic actions. You have to do it a zillion times and see expectation. The question is, can you do this fast? And it turns out that what we were saying is basically that computing the finite horizon 
value of a policy. So we'll first look at the finite horizon case. That means one of the things I didn't explain is how long is this trajectory? When do I stop? In the case of finite horizon, you know exactly if I am in the k, k states to go, in k epochs to go, then each of my trajectories is going to be exactly k or smaller. If in fact I go through a terminating state, in which case I can't live after. Right? So you can actually do this. You can basically get for each you know, horizon, I can get, uh, if let's say, horizon 10 for the state S, I can get 10 sized behavior, simulate 10 sized behaviors with respect to this policy, with respect to this policy that I'm finding its value of. Right? And then compute the cumulative value each time, cumulative reward each time divided by the number of times you simulated. That would be the average expected, or the expected value of this state with respect to this policy. Do it for each of the states. You could do this. And up until now, there is no conceptual difference. This is where you become a computer scientist. And you'll say the numbers that I'm doing, the, the computations I'm doing, are likely to have humongous overlaps because the states are connected to the same states. It's not like the world is changing every time. So there should be a simpler way of computing this value. And the basic idea is basically you have these recurrence relations for value with zero steps to go of a policy pi in state S. This is actually the, what's called the base case of the recurrence relation. Which basically says, if you have zero steps to go, then the value of the state is its immediate reward. Because you have no more places to go. And if this is the base case, then I can think of k steps to go for the policy value. K steps to go for the policy pi. K steps to go for the policy pi is you always take the reward because you are in the state S, you reward washes over you, you take the reward. Plus this part, which looks very surprisingly kind of complex, but what it's saying is now that you are in this state, if you do Whatever the policy is saying you should do in this state, pi S K is telling you that in state S, with K steps to go, thou shalt do action 15. That's, the, that's what the policy said. So I will do whatever is the action that the policy said I will do. I'll do it in the state S. Then if I look at the action matrix, state, state, probability matrix, then I know what is the probability if I do this action, let's say A15 in state S, what's the probability that I'll get to S dash? So I just read the 15th row of the matrix and figure out what the probability is. That's what the transition probabilities are supposed to tell. So if that happens, you'll suddenly find yourself in S dash. And you have K minus one steps here. Before you had k steps to leave, you have k minus one steps. So I would then say, what if I already computed s dash's value for k minus one steps to leave? Then I can compute s's value with k steps to leave. So there's a nice recurrence here. The base case for this recurrence is this. So you start actually with zero steps to go and propagate. Now, so looking at it a picture wise, so looking at this picture wise, so basically, you know, for the um, base case, V0 SI is R of SI. Okay. And then if you are T steps to go, 
And if you are computing the values, zero steps to go for all the states, one step to go all the states, and t steps to go all the states. Then after computing the t steps to go, I can compute the value for t plus one steps to go. If I'm coming this way. The first level, everybody is, is numbers because the zero is the re rewards. Because zeroth value has numbers, one value will have numbers, then the two, and then three, etc. Okay. So what exactly do you have to do? Well, for example, if in, in state S with T plus one steps to go, if the pi says pi state S T plus one is a one. That means the pi the policy says thou shalt do action a one. If you find yourself in state S and you have T plus one steps to live. I told you this before. Supposedly, I gave you this really full policy. And I said, guys, execute this. You don't want to believe me. So Rao could be wrong. Let's just figure out what's the upside for this. What's the policy value of this policy? That's what you're trying to do. OK? So then, basically, since you're doing A1, A1, let's say, in this model, with 0.7 takes you to S1, and 0.3 takes you to S4. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just want to make sure that I understand fully. So the when you said that doing an action from a given state is probabilistic, like it could go in multiple different directions. Mm -hmm. But the policy is not probabilistic. <laughs> if given a state and the time, it has to do a certain action. Yes, it's a good question that you should ask yourself. Thank you for asking that question. Which is, why is it that everything else is probabilistic? Not everything else, like the actions are probabilistic. But rewards are deterministic, suddenly. Right? For every state, you get the same reward. What if the rewards are also probabilistic? That would be a slightly more general question. But a more interesting question is why are you only comparing among the policies that are deterministic. Look at this thing that I'm saying. If you are actually following this, you're way ahead of lots and lots of people who think they understand AI. Okay. So we talked about determinism at the level of the actions. That's one level. That means if I do an action, just like that gentleman said, what's your name? Ethan. Ethan. So just like what Ethan said, the actions can be deterministic are stochastic. And in the case of MDPs, actions are stochastic. I mean, generally, they can be stochastic. But Ethan's question is, why are you only looking at policies that are deterministic? That means in every state, if you find yourself in that state, you'll only do this action, not with some probability A1, some probability A7. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So. It turns out that we are currently looking at what are called pure policies. Pure policies means deterministic policies. The thing that he's asking about are what are called mixed policies. Mixed policies. That means given a state, you stochastically pick the action you will do in that state where the probability is determined by the policy. You get this. So Ethan's big worry, which is a very good worry to have if you are thinking deeply, is what if I found the optimal pure policy by whatever thing that I'm doing you know, in today. And it turns out that that's much worse than the optimal mixed policy. You understand what I'm saying? Because mixed policy set is a superset of pure policy set. You would agree with that. There's deep theory that shows that if there is a, for normal MDPs, the ones that we're looking at, if there is an optimal mixed policy, there is also a pure policy which gives the same value. 
Do you understand what I just said? For MDPs, that is true. That for any optimal mixed policy, there is actually an optimal pure policy that gives the same value. So ignoring mixed policies doesn't hurt. Okay. However, two differences, which is what we'll do here. We'll do pure policies. Two things. Can any of you think of a scenario where you did mixed policies? What? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Attending class during COVID in person. That's, yeah, I mean, that's true. But I mean, but the question is, so what I'm interested in seeing is scenarios where the optimal mixed policy, optimal pure policy is way worse than optimal mixed policy. So I'll tell you a joke. And if you understand this joke, you understand why mixed policies are important. How many of you know Simpsons? Okay. So there is this thing I'll be able to send you once I go home that, so Lisa and Bart are trying to, you guys should remember who is what in Simpsons. Lisa is a smart one. Bart is the rambunctious dumb one, right? So, so Lisa and Bart are trying to make some important decision, which movie they should go to or something. They can't agree. So Lisa says, let's play rock, paper, and scissors. And then next cartoon panel, there are two bubbles on both of their heads. Both of them are happy. Bart says, yay, we are playing rock, paper, and scissors. And Lisa says, yay, we are playing rock, paper, and scissors. And Bart always picks rock. You guys understand what I just said? If you understood this, how many of you know rock, paper, scissors the game? The whole point of rock, paper, scissors is if you have a pure policy, then you're screwed. It's the same thing in tennis serving. If you're serving exactly the same way, your opponent will take that out and you will be out of the game very fast. So in games, if you only search in the space of pure policies and say, this is the optimal pure policy, you could be arbitrarily away from the optimal policy. For MDPs, that's not true. MDP is a single agent. Again is, the reason is Lisa is not nature. She's a force of nature, but she's not nature. Right? And that's where Bart got screwed. Nature wouldn't have cared that Bart is dumb. Lisa, on the other hand, as I said, you know, if you, are, if you can play a game against nature versus humans, pick nature. Because humans can exploit your failures. And so in games, which are basically, you can have MDPs which capture multi-agent scenarios, you have to search in the space of mixed policies. And the other thing which will come later is there are ways in which you can directly search in the space of policies. So you're looking for a policy, just like this hill climbing thing I mentioned, you can search in the space of policies by hill climbing your way to increase the policy's value. In such cases, you should be, the one thing that we know that works well for this kind of gradient search, uh, hill climbing search is gradient, ascent or gradient descent, which is basically what means that the underlying function has to be continuous. Do you get this point? Calculus is not defined for discrete functions. It's only defined for continuous functions. If you search in the space of pure policies, that's the space of discrete functions. To make them continuous, you act as if each policy essentially says for each state, there's a probability distribution with which it picks the values. And then you are essentially tweaking those probabilities. What you really want is a pure policy, 
but you search in this much more complex case of mixed policies because the mallet, the hammer you have, which is gradient descent, only works for continuous functions. So you convert a nice discrete function. We'll get to this much, much later. Maybe we'll get to it, or maybe one day, 10 years from now, you'll say, yeah, that's what I was saying. Uh, okay, so this is the problem. You ask any question, there is a rabbit hole. But asking a question is the only way you understand. You know, it's not, I'm, I'm just hoping, by the way, I wanted to say this, that I wanted to teach this class so that people will keep me on my feet. I have to say until now, not really. You haven't managed to keep me on my feet. I'm waking up and somehow dragging myself to the class. Once in a while, questions like this are good. What do you mean, really? I mean, come on, you guys are honest students. If you don't think about, we just say, tell me what to do in the exam. You took the wrong class. You could do it much simpler with some other class. Okay. Anyway, coming back to here. So you have A4, A7, which is 0.7 and 0.3. And then, so I do basically 0.7. Okay, so I basically, what this is saying here is 0.7 times Vt of S1 plus 0.3 of Vt of S4. That would be the value here. And notice that these would be numbers by this time because you're coming from V0. So this is a numeric expression and that would be the value. This is by the way, computing the value of a given policy. Okay. So that's what that animation is saying. Um, so, if I know this, then I can do, how do I compute optimal policy via this idea? Well, here is a good idea. If you have number of states, S number of states, in each state you can do at most A number of actions. How many pure policies are there? Again, pure policy is a retronym. Until this guy woke up, we were happily saying just policy. But because of him, we have to say pure policy. <coughs> How many pure policies are there? In each state, I can do, first state, I can do action, A actions. Second state, I can do one of the A actions. Third state, I can do one of the A actions. So really, A power S number of policies are there. That's just a discrete number. So, since you already know loops, loop for each of these A power S policies, do this previous calculation, compute the entire value, finite horizon value. It's like a huge vector. Basically, it's saying value with 10 steps to go for S1, S2, S3, value for nine steps to go S1, S2, S3, value for eight steps to go S1, S2, S3. They're all numbers. You put this down, put the next one's value down, and see which one is bigger. You decide to vector, one vector is bigger than the other. If it is equal, in, it is at least greater than the other one in one place, in the real number value, and it's equal or greater in every other place. That's how you say vectors are bigger. So I gave you, a, a, a nice program that you can write. And in fact, some people are probably writing this program. And it takes a long time. And then Bas says, how come you're not done with the MDP? It's a very big MDP, extremely big MDP, a huge loop. I need Amazon, AWS, more money. <laughs> and nobody will say, AWS is needed. This is as dumb an idea. This is as dumb an idea as sorting a sequence of numbers by considering all their permutations. They're only n factorial of them and checking if each of them, if any of them are sorted. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So it's an n factorial times like, you know, n. So n n factorial sorting algorithm. You need to understand why that is dumb before you become a computer scientist. You've just been told the good stuff. So you will be 
my my general mental model of people in random companies are that every day they are inventing or reinventing exponential algorithms for polynomial problems why because it works okay it turns out that really you can do it much simpler this way and this is in the last 2 minutes i'll say it and that was that example that you saw if i gave you a policy you wouldn't have had this max you would have done only the action that the policy asked you to do so no compare this I'm sorry compare this to the, I'm sorry to this the only difference between those two there is no max there was no max here which means it's basically a set of linear equations okay here there is a max so all you are saying is i don't know which action is best for each action i'll compute the back propagated value and pick the best so if i were to do this it would look like this here i have vt value for s1 to s4 and to compute vt plus 1 i realize that not only to have a1 i also have a2 i'll compute what i get by applying a1 i'll compute what i get by applying a2 so a1 basically i will get this as the value remember this will be a number a2 i'll get this these are two numbers to take max that will be the value so if you want to see this basically what is happening is that basically at that point you take the max of the two actions if you do this it looks sort of horizontal but you turn it around so you don't expect maximize expect maximize that's computing finite horizon optimal value function and we'll come back and say that for infinite horizon act as if it is just finite with a very large k and keep doing this until between two iterations the value function hasn't changed much in which case it must have converged but before that happens you should have guaranteed that such a convergence is possible it turns out that if you have infinite horizon mdps and you have discounting then you are guaranteed to converge that's it okay let's stop this